Yeah, I have a question for you, Jason. So, you know, with your, the way you have received hip hop and jazz and, you know, charting your, um, your artistry career um, and understanding um, the nuances of hip hop and especially at a time period where there's certain things that you do outside of the line, people frown on. And I'm, it's the same way in jazz, right? You know, mm -hmm. if you don't, if you're not operating and your sound is not, you know, f fitting this, then those gatekeepers kind of give you that like, mm, you know, um, <laughs> so, but with, with you, you know, there weren't, like you are a pioneer, you know, of sorts in terms of like being from, you know, both worlds of jazz and hip hop and venturing out to kind of, you know, like become, you know, you and your music in, in a way that it hasn't been done. Um, what kind of constraints or, or challenges did you come across as you were making your music and, and what was it that you wanted to achieve, understanding the direction and the inspiration that you had? Mm. Yeah, that's a good, good question. You know, I always thought that if I was going to make music that I was going to code it for myself first uh, before I coded it for a public. And even on, <laughs> this is real. If you go to my very first solo that I took on a record, which was on this Greg Osby record on Blue Note Records, in that first solo, uh, in the piano solo, I, I, I quote Shook Ones by Mob Deep. <laughs> because for me, like I said before, that is language that is as important as anything else. And so how do you, continue to not necessarily, I'm not going to grab a mic, right? Or I'm not going to call Premiere and say, Primo, let's make a track. I don't know how to do that, right? But I know that how that music uh, has shaped me and shaped my thinking goes beyond kind of what I do as an artist. It really kind of helps me be a citizen of the world. Yeah. And, you know, and the, the, I think the hardest thing to, to figure out has been recently, I'd say, is is trying to tell people how much it has changed you and you try to show it through actions. Yeah. And so I would say the, the strong arm that I did was at the Kennedy Center. And it was by calling uh, Q-Tip, you know, and saying we should really start a, a, a hip hop department <clears throat> here at the Kennedy Center that's much like the opera, the, the orchestra, you know, and, and because I know that that's the music that is right now has made the most global impact and how can America and America's institution, performing arts institution like the Kennedy Center, not necessarily have a space for it, right? Okay. That is theirs, right? That is thoughtful and curated and about conversation and about performance and, and about breaking down the frequencies that Molly Marl does, you know? So how do we make a platform and a space for that, you know, to bring you and Adrian out, right? So that, uh, for me, that I felt like that was kind of a thing that Dr. Billy Taylor did, who started the jazz program, program mm -hmm. at the Kennedy Center. So I felt like there were never enough people to tell me no, because yeah. all the, the great the great thinkers in it were always kind of like, you know, touching at the edge of it and showing how you could move it through it. And of course, you know, being kind of born from Thelonious Monk, it already teaches you that you have to code differently anyway mm -hmm. for you to have a language. And, right. uh, and you know, and I, and I gotta say, it probably kind of helped me build a tougher skin, you know, um, to the kind of criticism, but it never was enough to stop my teachers from shoving me in the back and saying, no, nah, keep going keep going you right. know and that felt you know that felt uh i felt warned and empowered by it too you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. no i definitely um can't attest that i mean because we went to the same school and i think we had some of the same teachers mm -hmm. and i you know i would ask about it i'd be like hey so how did how did jason do in this class <laughs> you know, I would, I would straight up ask. I'd be like, you know, how, how, how did he do? Cause in, in comparison of like, am I doing it right? You know, <laughs> because, you know, here I am, you know, at Manhattan School of Music is, you know, uh, coming from uh, New Haven, Connecticut, uh, Orange, Connecticut. And, you know, first time at college. And to my idea, I was supposed to be studying with Kenny Barron. Right. Mm -hmm. And that idea was kind of in the same wheelhouse of where I was at, you know, studying Ahmad Jamal, like we were talking about, studying with Dr. Billy Taylor at the time, you know, really studying a certain uh, level of, uh, well, certain, certain, I guess, uh, part of the room, I guess you want to call it, of, of music, right? 
And so I remember, you know, I got a letter and it said you're going to be studying with Jason Moran. And I was like, all right, cool. Right. And I was like, yeah, I know all right. you're disappointed. <laughs> no, I wasn't. I was not disappointed. But I was like, all right, cool. I'm going to check this out. You know, and I remember you were playing. You came and you played in uh, at uh, Long Wharf Theater in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. And it was my first time seeing Jason. And I remember I saw the first thing I saw was uh, I showed up and there was no piano bench. It was a chair. And already I was like, what is about to happen? You know, and then there was no upright bass. It was Taurus's uh, uh, bass guitar. So I already I was like, I don't know what I'm about to see like, mm -hmm. at all, you know. And then I think you came out, Jason. I think you played uh, You've Got to Be Modernistic. I think that was the first mm -hmm. track played. Mm -hmm. And for me, and I had been studying stride piano up until that with Ron Burton, you know, uh, mm -hmm. studying with Ron Burton. I was studying with uh, Dr. Billy Taylor. Um, with Dave Brubeck. So I was already studying with these certain people that kind of, you know, stride piano, but it was old. You know, I was a kid. I was like, you know, 17, 18, maybe, you know, and it was like, all right. But when Jason played stride piano, it sounded like, you know, it sounded like you, Ali. It sounded like, uh, D'Angelo. It sounded like uh, Lucy Pearl. Like it sounded all the groups that you've been in part of. It, it reminded me. It was like the same exact kind of idea. And I was like, "Wow, this is so weird. Like this is so hip. Like why is this so dope? You know? Because I've been through this. I've been through you know Jelly Roll Morton, and I've you know, and just to get used to the 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 movement of playing. But it was something about the intent and the way it sounded to me. And so when I went to Manhattan School of Music, I was like, I can't wait to study with this dude because I don't know what's going to happen. Right. Yeah. I don't know where we're going to be at, you know, but we there's this thing that, you know, and it's part of the reason why I want to get you both together um, was because there's this, uh, again, lineage, you know, yeah. again, there's this this sharing of information, the sharing of each other's stories that influenced the world, you know, that influenced me, you know, and so um I love that. You know, I want to talk about really briefly before we go, um, just the bands that you guys have been a, a part of that have affected mm -hmm. how you approach music, approach uh, your expression. I know with Jason, uh, you know, Charles Lloyd, Greg Osby, you know, I mean, there's, there's so many, so many people, you know, uh, uh, you, Ali, with, with Fife, with, with, Q with with Dilla. I mean, there's so many cats with Raphael, you know, like how do you Adrian, you know, like how do you guys, you know, um, when you make these connections with these different musicians or different artists, you know, what do you bring to it and what do you get out of it? You want to go? No, you got it. I'll let you go ahead. Um, it's a very good question, question yeah. Christian. Um, I can say, you know, like with regards to my first band, um, there was a guy that I was in a group with in high school just before Tip asked me, hey, man, I heard you, you DJ, make me a mixtape, right? And it was, it was uh, a, another rapper and, uh, and I, and I was responsible for doing music. And at the time, I was 14, I had sampler, keyboard, drum machine, and uh, a four-track Tascam tape. Uh, and that's because of my uncle, the uncle that I mentioned before, Uncle Mike. Um, and then right when thing, when I was starting to kind of understand, oh, yeah, and the Casio, the, uh, I can't remember the name of that, the, the sampler. It was like, had just come out. Um, uh, uh, new Shoes was out, and you could do the, uh, 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 uh. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, so the, it was things you could do on a portable that you didn't have to sit at home to do. Um, and right at that time, Tip asked me, to, to join his group. And so what I get is, you know, that that's like 14, 15. And he and his introduction and knowledge of jazz because of his relationship to his father and his father was, you know, deeply into jazz. And, <clears throat> and so, um, but at the same time, you have responsibilities. Neither of us played instruments. We both just, our instrument was a turntable and yeah. vinyl, you know, and a sampler. And so um, we both brought different elements of what that meant, but then there were aspects that were the same. Um, and, and he being 
the writer, obviously his approach to music is completely different based off of just, you know, the way he writes his cadences and things like that. And, and that also would inform his choices and, you know, and me not being a writer, having to understand, you know, what motivates him, what things he's feeling, not feeling because of that. And so that's just, you know, from again, non-instrumentalist, non-player, um, a mind, mind frame. And then likewise with, with Fife and Fife's art and his, his, um, his style is way different than tips, you know? Um, and so really just trying to figure out what all of that means inside of being children or, you know, teens and what the, uh, the, the, we were able to live out our dreams by making records when we really didn't wholly know what that meant. You know, once we got into low end theory and being in a professional environment with Bob Power, then we mm. understood who we understood like, oh, this is what it means now. So that, you know, that definitely gave us a lot of information. But then because of it, when I met, you know, meet Raphael and Raphael's like, hey, Tony's wants tribe to remix a record for the Tony's. And we're like, why? These guys are like to us, they're they're our our earth, wind and fire, you know, mm. um, of our age group. It's like, what could we do for them? They're like masters. And they're like, no, you guys are masters. And so, you know, being around them and and understanding like, oh, this is possible. Like you like I'm programming a beat and Raphael just has a microphone up freestyling like a like I'm used to with Tip Mm. and Fife. But he's playing bass while he's freestyling. And he looks at his whole his band and says, follow me. And they listen to the notes he's playing and they all have a language that I don't understand and they understand theory and they know what key he's in. And so they're following him. And I'm like, mind blown. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, need, I need to be here because this is where I want my art to go and, and learn it from that. So there's all those sort of dynamics. And then, you know, where I am now with Adrian, where his, uh, his journey through music is very similar, where he grew up on uh, vinyl records, turntable sampler. Mm -hmm. looking around wanting his music to sound a certain way i can't call anyone i don't know bass players i don't know piano players (laughs) you know or when i call someone i'm waiting all day for them because you know they don't take it as seriously as i'm taking it so all right well mm, note for note let let me figure out how to figure this out to then Mm -hmm. learning how to play bass drums piano flute saxophone it's the exact same thing for me it was like okay i'm hearing these records want to know how to play what I'm hearing and the other things I'm hearing that's not printed. It's no one else's thought, my own thought. So um, I've been blessed to be around just people who are open-minded, yeah. um, who are as curious as I am and um, who are willing to um, share what they know and then push you to, they're pulling out trying to be the best that they can be. I'm trying to be the best and I, I can be. Um, there's certain bands I've been in. There's been an unhealthy competition. I have to yeah. say that, you yeah. know, which is demoralizing. And then, you know, then there's a healthy competition, you know, and when there's a healthy competition, everyone is pushing each other to be the best. Obviously, no matter whether it's healthy, or unhealthy, I think ultimately everyone wants everyone to be the best. Mm-hmm. And so those are the environments that I've been in and, um, if there's something that you don't know, you know, mm. you show it. Dilla, I will say last, and I'll end it on there because I know we don't have a lot of time. Dilla was different. He was special. Yeah. He, 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 um, you know, when, when we formed the UMA, there was a time period where we were working independently and Tip was like, you know, I need us all to be in the room together. That's one thing I love about Tip. He likes for people to be in the room together. The challenge it was for me was, we all, our instrument is the same instrument. There's only one MP, right? Yeah. So it's like, it's like, imagine if there's one piano. Well, I mean, you guys, and it's like five of you guys lined up and you, you know what I mean? You get what I'm saying. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so, um, but Dilla would come in. This is, this is the thing about that situation. Dilla would come in, play a record, you know, a couple of times, Start chopping it up, flipping it up, make the song, go back upstairs in like 15 minutes. <laughs> and me and Tip are just standing there like, yo, it takes us like days to really like 
break it down to figure out like how we going to layer and Dilla would just do it like that, mm. you know? So mm. he was special, mm. yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. You bring up a thing though, that maybe uh, Ali that is about uh, accompaniment, accompanists, right? Like, mm. right. So pianists are many times we're accompanists, you know, and our job is kind of like what you just described, like to be open, to know how to push or pull somebody, know when to raise the bar and also know when to just be the support, right? Mm -hmm. I think always, and then when you were talking, I was just thinking about the role of the DJ uh, and the role of the DJ in a group, you know, like what it is that you bring to not only the studio when you make the piece, but also when you bring it onto the stage too. Mm -hmm. you know, your position many times is in the center of the stage on a platform, <laughs> right? Like being able to scan everything, right? The crowd mm -hmm. and the crew on the stage. Mm -hmm. And maybe if there's a question I have for you, just Christian, sorry, but I'm just going to ask a question. <laughs> it's kind of like what, you know, when, when you, when you're at that position, because like, so at your DJ position, you see everything. A piano, when it's on the stage, generally in a jazz setting, we see the back of the stage. We don't right. look out in front, right? So our p positioning is here. So I have to use the ear thing like a lot more. Um, but from your position, from all these decades of kind of like sitting in that position, what what do you kind of notice about how uh, the performer receives what you play and how the audience receives it? You know, um, that's a very good question. Um, for me, in terms of performance, because we would rehearse, mm. there is uh, you know there are things you do in a dojo where you don't have to you know what's going to happen, so to say, mm. you know, because you guys, you know, you rehearsed it. But the other thing about that is then is the other element, which is the audience, you know, and what happens with the audience is something you can't pre predetermine in your rehearsal space. And that level, that energy is the, it's the equivalent of like when you're making music and leaving, leaving space for the creator to, to, to shape, you know? Yeah. And so you, mm -hmm. the, the, the space and the energy that the crowd has, like, it depends on where you're playing, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we've played to rooms where there were like 12 people in a room. And, you know, the job, no matter, is to always give you, a, you know, 100%. But you, you, I'm playing and I'm looking at Tip and Fife and I'm like, they're not feeling this at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's just like, but, you know, we have to remember what the mission is. And right. so then, you know. You know, it's one glance back, maybe they'll look at me and I'm just like, yeah. And then they're like, okay, you know, or vice versa. I may be just kind of a little bit subdued and Tip is just like, yo, you know, he'll give me a look and I'm like, oh, word. All right. Like snap into it. You know, the, right. other, the other element for me is, as you said, as you pointed out, I'm thinking of um, because I'm operating all these things, um, I'm, I'm worrying about making sure the cues, the dropout so that, you know, it gives the effect. So when it, the music comes back on, there's sometimes when there's dips in volume, it's not just a complete pullout. There's, you know, EQ dips and stuff like that. Yeah. So that tip voice, Fife's voice, they, they're really on top. And it's a moment of the song that they really want to get into deeper into the crowd. And mm -hmm. it's a matter of that. It's a matter of being aware of like, you know, there's sound difficulties is happening that no one else but me, I know. And I got to look at tip to give mm -hmm. him a cue like, Right. I know you're not getting what you need. I'm not getting what I need, but we, you know, so there's so many different dynamics. And then most, again, going back to the crowd, that crowd is everything. Yeah. You know, it, it really is. And so there is a, a, a give and take and it goes back and forth and the positions get switched constantly mm -hmm. every second, every time the, the unfolding of, of the tune and, mm -hmm. um, there are certain environments you go into and it's just like, you could not imagine that it would draw out mm. such the greatness in you. You, you know, we all know we're great walking on that stage. We, we go in with a prayer. We go in with thanks and mm. we go in with the, let's just have fun, but like y'all really let's kill it. You right. Know? And let's kill anyone who else who stood on this stage before us and after us. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> like, I don't care. There's 80 performers, y'all. They better right. only have one name on their mouth when they walk out of here. So there's there's all of those elements and you see yeah. it. And then there's certain times when the crowd is not going to let you have it that way. 
yeah. they are just like, yo, play my hit, man. And especially for <laughs> us, right, you know, right. we've had we have we've had range of decades. And, right. and and we were fortunate to be able to come back into a time where, you know, 16 years later, after not having one song and you're competing up against like so many people who have like number one hits, you know, for the past decade, even let's not even count the full 16 years. And, right. you know, man, some of these kids might not even know who we are. Mm. Yeah. But okay, let's go out here. Let's you know watch it. Let's know when we have to change up. You know, you're watching the crowd. You know, like yo, you know, let's cut this here. Let's move this here. Let's move this song over here. Like you know, there's a lot of. I don't know if you ever go back to. I'm sorry to be so winded with the question, oh, uh, the yeah. answer. Well, if you ever go back, Tip and I, he does a lot of communicating. He's a hell of a band leader, you mm. know, and he's a hell of a performer. He reads a crowd. You know, he reads everything that's going on, you know, like a, a, a computer processor just download and processing. So, again, it's a lot of language that occurs between he and I that people don't know about. Like he and I are so in sync. And so, mm. you know, we're I'm reading the crowd. I'm seeing it one way. He's a DJ. He's seeing it his way. He's an MC. He's seeing it a different way. Right. He's knowing like, oh, I got to move it over here. All right. Y'all shy, you know, and sometimes he'll run over and be like -da 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 -da, and run back out because he knows. He can't he can't sit with me and have a, a long five minute dialogue. It's like I got to count on my man to know that I said three words. He knows where it's going to go. And then I'm back out there giving the crowd my full attention. And he gives the crowd the full attention. And then the dynamic between he and Fife is another element. So mm. you ask the question as a DJ. A good DJ, but as a performer is always going to pay attention to all the elements. And that's I think what separates those kind of DJs from even just, you know, club DJs and, and radio mm -hmm. DJs. There's another element that you have to always be aware of. And then to bring that into outside of being a DJ and just being a musician. And so those, it's a lot of information that informs mm -hmm. us. And it goes back to the thing that we we're talking about earlier, which is just understanding that, you know, you want to take that feeling be it from heartache, be it from joy. Um, you want to be authentic mm -hmm. and you want to you want to present it in a way that there's something that people could get from it. And at the same time, in turn, we're walking away as performers, you know, with information about that audience, that city. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. like for an example, I don't, you guys both can probably tell the story the very first time you went to some of these European cities, the very first time. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Way different than the local yeah. home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This information that you get back from yeah. what you put out, you know, and so this, this is your life. First couple of. Uh, First couple of times touring um, with with Christian McBride, man, it was so different because it was my first time in Europe, my first time in this big, you know, this this band with somebody, and I remember like I would play and then people wouldn't even applaud. It would just be silence. It was deep, you know. But you had to, you know, you got to go with it. It was like you have to let you have to take your lumps, but you have to also like learn about exactly what you're saying, how to read the crowd, how to follow the the uh, other members of the of the band you know like listen to the cues learn the cues you know because especially if you this is the first time you in the band you know you got to learn exactly you know what exists already or mm -hmm. what doesn't exist because in that band specifically it was a very new band mm -hmm. everything was up in the air i mean we played i remember there was a, a song we used uh we would play and it, we play that song for like 30 minutes and like you know, if you know, and we would just kind of go, and and anybody that was around during that time knew that like once, and that was like the third song of the set. Like so, mm. after that, I mean, you know, we played like maybe another tune, and that was it. And people paid their money to see a whole show, you know. So we would like we had to learn how to do all this, you know, and how to how to read the audience, how to how to dance mm. with the audience and everyone else, you know. So uh, mm -hmm. that's super. That's super interesting, man. Mm -hmm. I I. I uh, the way you make it sound, especially being a DJ, reminds me of just like being a bass player. Like you, mm -hmm. typically you're in the middle, 
Yeah, you know, yeah. see, especially as Jason said, you know, we're usually on the side and we can't, you know, we unless we're like Nat King Cole and we turn to the side and play mm-hmm. and stare mm-hmm. at you the entire time, mm-hmm. you know, we, we don't typically get a chance to do that. You know, drummers mm-hmm. can do that, you know, depending, I mean, you know, depending where they position, depending on where their symbol is, but the bass player is always in the middle scanning, mm-hmm. you know. A lot of the times I'll take my cues from my bass players since they're they're there. I'll watch them and see what they'll, you know, which way their faces, you know, uh, are well, what the expression is. Like if they're like agreeing with somebody else that I heard in the back of me, then it's like, mm. all right, good. But if they have, you know, this face of like, this ain't <laughs> Then, you know, you got to adjust. You got to figure out, you know, it's up to me to figure out what to do, <laughs> you know, as the band leader or or not, you know, but it's, it's such an interesting thing to think of um, to make that comparison again of of DJing, of the culture of, of hip hop and and black excellence and excellence all around and the different ways we experience that and different ways we express that, you know, yeah. Um uh, what about you, Jason? I know we gotta we gotta run, but this is this conversation is amazing. I really don't want to stop. But uh, anything to add on that? No, nah, you know I've just I've always been interested in. I mean, besides the music we play, right? It's the rooms we play in, and mm. where does black music get put? You know, like so if you're in Lagos, you know, a young kid on the street playing, you know, drums is planet not in a club he's on the street killing right. the shit right so right. or if you're in the juke joint in mississippi right so you're off the road right in, you know in a, in a place and 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 i always think that it's like these humble revolutions happen in these places you know where you don't even get to like you know right now we're doing like covid tracing right so anybody yeah. has a test right then you trace where they go but in music you can't trace what people and how they use it you know yeah. how they take something that they just heard and go back into their own you know, environments or homes or whatever in communities and, and watch, you know, and so when I think about, so the reason I kind of asked that thing about that is because also is the architecture of the music physically also mm. tells us so much about the symbolism of how stage is used, right? Mm. So whether it's the, the, the dance of the ritual, ritual dances that happen, where do they enter from? How, what does the circle mean when it happens on the stage? Mm. What does the cipher mean yeah. when we get in the circle and have that, right? What does it mean to, as a position of power to have the DJ or the drum on a throne looking out over everybody, right? The center mm. is the rhythm, right? All these things are like part of kind of like mapping uh, how our music has gone on to kind of change the scope of the globe. Um, but it also still continues to take cues about where it's going next, right? So this version here online on the screen is like a version. But, you know, I'm always curious about where and what these signs and what these histories also tell us, what we're supposed to know, what we don't know, the things that are still the mystery that we still mm-hmm. search for, you know. And it get you know, like, so here you talk about that, man. For me, it's like that's thesis material. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know that 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 people need to hear um because it really does impact us as as listeners uh and as as performers so you know I'm just thankful for that answer because it really things I never thought about from your position about how you read so you have to be able to read you know yeah um one thing Christian just in terms of just the topic in of itself and where we are in the the contemporary space of hip hop and and jazz um it's it's interesting. There's a younger collective of 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 uh, I don't want to say kids, but just you know, y- young adults that, or even teenagers that are actually learning, you know, and discovering about you know certain music from the '90s, and no differently than like how you know I may have discovered certain aspects of R and B and jazz you know, of like 20 years prior to my existence. Um, And so that's, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't, time will tell what will happen, you know, with that. I I will just, the point of what I want to say now is just strictly off of the, the, the uh, most prominent and um, mainstream part of hip hop right now. Seems like there's a not, the same amount of appreciation of what came before it. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, I don't know if, 
that haven't done enough schooling to understand like in, in societies when there has been that disconnect and what it has meant for the not only the modern but the future of that society but it just doesn't seem like a good thing now it is what it is there's almost so much you can do and if that's what it is you know that's if that's what's meant for that for where we are now to get to whatever that future is is going to be then so be it but i know that there's and going back to just the opening yeah there's nothing but a benefit when you look at what came before you mm-hmm. to to figure out where you are in your place and then how you make your impression and move on and mm-hmm. that if anything is not a lot that really disappoints me when it comes to music cuz it is supposed to be about you know your own human ex- expression but just knowing that there's such a, a detached kind of a a culture of the the past and kind of like ew like ew <laughs> like ah that's old nah you know right. um to 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 and not and oh, every generation has that out as old but to the level of not having reverence for it mm-hmm. That's scary to me. And so, you know, I hope that, you know, whatever happens with regards to our beloved art form, that Mm -hmm. it remembers where it came from, which precedes me. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking, we're talking centuries and centuries and centuries Mm -hmm. of existence. And it's like when you discount any aspect of that you discounting yourself and, and seeing the construct of where we are in America specifically and how we are and have been discounted. Like yeah. we cannot, like we yeah. have to do the, we have to do the work, you know, and, and the work obviously is a lot to that work, but part of that work is really understanding our past and yeah. so that we can move forward. So, and I'm speaking obviously politically, socially, but from a music perspective, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. the, 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 the information is given the jazz, the jazz messengers, <laughs> you know, right. they gave us a lot of right. information. Right. Shout out to Art Blakely right. and the right. jazz messengers. <laughs> so like take that, receive that message, yeah. you know, for the young, any young generation, any young cast out there who's listening, like, you know, I hope they walk away with a real appreciation of of I'm going to do hip hop. I know that. I don't know if I'm a mess with jazz. I might, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. there may be some information in there, but mm-hmm. just as long as there's a and a, a real awareness to where you come from, I think, mm-hmm. you know, then yeah. your future is going to be awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Man, well with that, I'm just going to say thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, you brothers. Appreciate thank you. y'all. All right. Thank y'all for coming oh, and, and hanging in the sandbox with me. Dope. And, uh, yeah, we we got to continue this conversation once the quarantining is lifted. Hopefully, we all get to <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get to some music. We can have some dueling right. pianos. I, I have, right. I have right. a few. I have a few keyboards in here, so there's, there's some sharing. Let's do it. Come on. Yeah. There's some sharing between the two of you. You don't have to battle over one NPC. That's right. Let's do it. I'm down. I'm down. All right, y'all. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Christian. You, yeah. Peace, Jason. All right.